record to the audience. All right. Welcome to day one of CCRN review, starting with cardiac. Okay, everyone will receive the test plan. I, I will always cover every week about how to pass the exam. I will also offer a, probably every third week a practice test that we'll look at in class together. And we'll talk about how you're looking at the question, how you're getting your answer, et cetera. Welcome everybody who is virtual. Welcome everybody who's here in person. And so we will begin. So now I'm gonna stop my sharing. Hi everyone. This may be the last time you see me because I'm gonna be moving around some anyway. I don't really like standing behind a podium very much. I was very fortunate to have my wonderful husband who came with me today and helped me set up an, a microphone into my computer. Not everybody will have that capability. And my husband said, if you break this, you are going to be sorry because this is his professional microphone. That's how my husband talks to me. Can you believe it? All right. Oh, beautiful. Okay. So first and foremost, I just want to start off with just a little bit of a quote that just says, do not ever let what you cannot do interfere with what you can. And what you can do is to gather this information together to pass this test. You can do it for certain. So I want to remind you that we're going to be covering a lot of information about cardiology, but today our focus is really going to be on ACS and acute MI. Now, if we have ACS and acute MI together in our minds, we're thinking about the, the problems that present with blood flow to the myocardium. So when you have acute coronary syndrome and you have occlusion to blood flow, you have limitation of blood flow and oxygen delivery to the myocardium, your myocardium will become ischemic and then it will become dead, which is infarction. So first you have limitation, ischemia, and then you have cell death, and that's infarction. When you have cell death and you've infarcted an area of the myocardium, you then will develop heart failure because the more myocardium you lose, the more your heart is going to fail. Now, there's other causes for heart failure that are not ischemia and that are not infarction, right? We know that people have heart failure from cardiomyopathy. So we talk about cardiomyopathy like it's something different, but cardiomyopathy is also heart failure. So really important for us to understand that categorization. So we start with ACS and acute MI, and then we appreciate how that branches. And it's also a big umbrella over many of these other disorders. Things that are really separate here are aortic aneurysms, right? And heart blocks, although they may come from acute coronary syndrome, and of course, acute coronary syndrome, MI, heart failure, ends up, not all of it, but drives towards cardiogenic shock, okay? So we think about this as an umbrella tree. We're gonna start with ACS, MI, cardiomyopathies, heart failure, cardiogenic shock, natural progression. And we're going to remind ourselves that there are two completely separate but intimately related components of the heart, mechanical and electrical. Today, we're talking about mechanics. But mechanical and electrical are significantly and intimately related. The best marriage you ever had, electrical and mechanical. So very important for us to appreciate that you can have electrical, I'm sorry, I wanna say it a different way. You cannot have mechanical response if you do not have electrical activation. Electrical activation causes mechanical response. Anything that interrupts electrical activation, that means anything that interrupts normal sinus rhythm is going to cause a disruption in the mechanics of the heart. That means just first degree block, atrial fib, a flutter, doesn't have to be V-fib and V-tac. Anything that interrupts normal electrical function is going to affect your contractile response. You must have electrical to have mechanical, but you can have electrical without mechanical. What do you call that? PEA. PEA means you have electrical, but not mechanical, okay? 
So electrical first, mechanical second. Now I want you to know that because when we talk about our coronary circulation, it's going to be vitally and profoundly important to remember this kind of component. 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 Flint, Flint. Okay, guys, okay, guys anybody on here? Just mute yourself. Thank you so much, my friends. Love that. Thank you. Okay, so always reminding yourself when you're thinking about this that when we talk about the coronary circulation, we say, okay, you, you already know this patient in a case study that's on your exam. This patient has had an inferior MI. You need to say, oh, that means they had an occlusion in the right coronary artery. What else does the right coronary artery supply? Because that's going to tell me how to apply my clinical judgment. Okay. So let's be sure first and foremost to understand that just like neurologically, so much similarity, just like neurologically, there's lots of circulatory vessels, but we're really only going to focus on four. And actually we're really focusing on two with a uh, separation into two more. Okay. So first and foremost, always important to remember that the main vessels that's a what? Uh-oh. The system is shutting down. You guys can see, but now my whole group can't see. I'm not sure what, oh, I probably stayed on the slide too long and I thought I was asleep. So it shut me down. All right. Pardon me? I know. I. I can't explain it. It's the ghost of Steiner Auditorium. And I have to wait for the system to shut down, which may also mean the lights will go off. Oh my God, we're haunted. It's some kind of cardiac ghost. By the way, you might see this little heart that I have on my lapel. I forgot to wear my other pin, which I received yesterday. There's a knife in it. It was given to me by a patient yesterday. Okay, I can't put the knife back in. All right, touch my screen. Now I got to drop it again power on the system. Who the heck knows why this happened, but I will talk to IT. I'm going to just continue to talk. I'm standing here. I'm looking at this. Sorry, my friends. So doesn't matter. I'm going to just talk. The aorta, which is the main vessel that exits, of course, the LV at the valve of the aorta. So that's called the cusp, the valve of the aorta. There's a right valve and a left valve leaflet. Those leaflets actually fill with blood at the beginning of diastole. So the LV has ejected blood up into the aorta. The blood falls back towards the LV and fills the cusps, the valves. And on the right cusp arises the right coronary artery. So from the right cusp of the aorta arises the right coronary artery. Yay. Okay. On the left cusp of the aorta arises the left coronary artery. Okay. So I want to be sure we appreciate the LV ejects up into the aorta, blood rushes into the aorta, and then falls back to the, towards the LV, filling the cusps, their little bowls, to close the valve, which is incredibly and profoundly important because what it means then is that my vessel, my primary coronary arteries arise from the right cusp, right coronary, and the, I have no idea what's happening, but I think it's that I just don't have enough power in my system to do everything. So let's see. I'm just not sure what to do about this. Uh, okay. Yep. I, I, it may go in and out a little, and I'm so sorry, because really I don't normally do virtual and projection and computer power can be variable. So please forgive me, but I'll just continue on and we'll all be okay. All right. So right coronary and left coronary artery are dependent, very important, on the diastolic pressure in the aorta. The valve closes, that's the beginning of diastole. When the aortic valve closes, that's the beginning of diastole. So the diastolic pressure in the aorta actually determines how those vessels fill, okay? Those vessels fill and 
the right coronary supplies really the right heart and the inferior wall. And we're going to talk about all of that. And the left coronary artery quickly splits into two main divisions. The one that comes down the front of the heart known as the LAD and the one that goes around the side of the heart known as the circumflex. So again, we're talking about four vessels, right coronary, listen to that word right, you know that means primary right side, okay? Left main, which splits into LAD, left anterior descending, and the left circumflex, okay? Why this is so important is that really you don't have to know all these other vessels, the PDA, the extender, whatever. You don't need to know that. You just need to have kind of a basic physiologic understanding here. Okay. Now, when we talk about the left anterior coronary artery, left anterior coronary artery, okay, that descends the anterior division of the heart. The right coronary goes over the right side. The circumflex goes around the left side. These are all the lists of the vessel. No one cares. You don't need to worry about it. Don't memorize it. It's just, I put it in here. Now I say, whoa, I shouldn't have even put that there because that probably feels confusing. Here's really what you care about. And this you do have to know, okay? So the left anterior descending coronary artery, hear the word anterior, supplies the anterior wall of the left ventricle. That's the major muscle mass. This is the one you worry about the most because of the muscle mass that is supplied by the LAD, the anterior wall of the left ventricle. Also, what we would consider to be high lateral, that means up towards the top, right? High lateral on the side, high lateral wall. The septum, which divides, the septum is the wall that divides the right ventricle and the left ventricle. And by the way, even though it is a left anterior coronary artery, and you hear the words left, you hear the word anterior, but it supplies both the electrical communication to the right heart and the primary electrical communication to the left heart. And those are called the bundles, the right bundle and the left bundle, the left anterior bundle. No one cares if you know anterior and posterior. So just forgive me when I say that. Just let me just say the LAD, biggest muscle mass, A for anterior, right bundle, left bundle. Okay. Is that good? So that's how you're going to remember it. LAD, biggest muscle mass anterior, right bundle, left bundle. Now, that's confusing sometimes for folks who are like, well, it's the left. How could it supply the right bundle? Because the right bundle arises in the septum and it supplies the anterior septum. Okay, that's why. So you can see that if I have a big LAD, depending on where that lesion is, I may have a patient who has right bundle branch block and who has half of the left bundle branch block and has only small activation of the heart left, which means they're really at risk for you. And that's how you look at them because that's what you're gonna expect. Okay, the, the lead placement, that's what you've got to know, my friends. The primary visualization of the anterior wall, pure anterior wall, pure anterior, are the leads B3, and V4. That's pure. Make sure that if you're on, you've muted yourself, my friends. That's pure anterior, V3 and V4. Please mute yourself, my friends, if you've just joined. Thank you. Okay. Pure anterior, V3 and V4. Anterior septum, V1, V2. Anterolateral, V5 and V6, but pure anterior. V3 and V4, okay? If I have that second division of my left main, remember left main into LAD, left main into circumflex. Think about the circumflex, that's such a lovely word. LAD supplies the anterior wall and the anterior electricals. The circumflex circles around the side of the heart. Circumflex circles around the side. Circumflex 
primarily for our purposes supplies the side circumflex circles around the side of the left heart and supplies the side which is lateral okay so that circumflex supplies the lateral and in about 20% of patients also supplies the posterior surface, the back wall. Okay, now that's pretty sophisticated. Again, uh, historically, the exam was 38% cardiac because it was written by cardiac nurses. Now it's 17% cardiac. So the specificity of a posterior infarct, highly unlikely anything anyone is going to ask you, right? It's really going to be more pure anterior, pure lateral. And then the right coronary artery, oh, sorry, 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 sorry. So also, so when we look at the left circumflex, we're going to use sideways leads for that. V5 and 6, lateral, that's low lateral. And lead 1 in AVL, that's high lateral. So when you're putting leads on your patient, it's always important to know what lead is represented as the positive lead. So when I'm using lead one, the positive lead is the left arm and AVL, L for left. Also the left arm is the positive lead. So we're gonna use that for lateral. We're gonna use V5 and six for lateral. And so I'm gonna look for circumflex changes and or anterior lateral in leads one, AVL, V5, V6. So those, just looking at your patient, Lead one, AVL, V5, V6, those leads are going to represent the side of the patient, the left side of the patient, lateral, okay? If I see a change in AVL, I'm going to expect to also see it in lead one because it's the same positive electrode. Good? Okay, perfect. Okay. Now, some of the sinus node is fed by the circumflex, about 45%. Some of the AV node, but just a little, 10% is supplied by the circumflex. So in a patient who has, comes into your area, is having a lateral STEMI, you're also going to be concerned that you may see a first degree AV block because that vessel also supplies the sinus node and you may see some delay in electrical transmission. Does that sound right to everybody? 45%. Again, no one's going to ask you for percentage. You have to clinically understand that a patient who presents with a lateral infarct may also have a first degree AV block. That's all. Good? Okay. Then we look at, amazingly, because when we talk about the heart, we talk about the right heart is not much muscle. The left heart is a big muscle. The right heart doesn't work so hard. The left heart works really hard. But then we take a look at the right coronary artery and look at that list, my friends. The right coronary artery supplies so many structures that we don't really think about. Hi, Hi guys, please make sure you mute yourself when you join. Thank you. I, it does not automatically mute you. You must mute yourself. Okay, so high uh, right coronary artery primarily supplies the inferior wall of the left ventricle. So the inferior wall is facing the foot. Inferior, F for foot. Inferior, F for foot. Okay, good. Inferior, F for foot. That means any leads that use a positive electrode that's down on the leg or the foot leads, actually look at the inferior wall. That would be leads two, three, and AVF. Two, three, and AVF are inferior leads. Now, this is really important for us to remember because I have a patient who comes in who maybe has some acute shortness of breath, nausea, vomiting, and is diaphoretic. And she's a 58-year-old woman. The very first thing I'm going to do is an EKG because women present differently. They don't often have chest pressure. And with inferior infarcts, frequently you have very, very significant parasympathetic symptoms. You sweat, you vomit, you're nauseated. 
I'm, I'm doing an EKG. And the first thing I'm going to look at are leads two, three, and AVF, looking at the inferior wall. Okay. Right coronary artery supplies the primary inferior wall of the left ventricle. But the right coronary artery also supplies the right ventricle. So by the way, we used to always, I mean, we do still, so I'm not, I, I don't have the authority to change the name. We used to always talk about an LAD or a left main as the widow maker, meaning that people who had a big occlusion, the LAD or the left main could die before you ever saw them. They'd have sudden cardiac death. The thing is, a right coronary artery lesion that's close to the aorta, that's proximal, that's what we call proximal, meaning close to the aorta, so you've lost a lot of circulation. Those patients actually die, but nobody really recognizes how sick they are because it's inferior. Ah, so what? It's an inferior. Uh-uh. Right coronary artery supplies the inferior wall, also supplies the right ventricle. And in 80% of the population, the right coronary artery also supplies the back wall of the heart, the posterior. Ms. Barbara, are we on a different, um, on the online? We can't see what you're talking about. Are you seeing the vessels? Are you seeing yeah, the screen? Yeah, we're still on the same. We're still on the same slide. Yep. Okay. Thank you. Yep. I'm talking about the right coronary artery. Okay. So supplies that that back portion of the septum, supplies the right ventricle. Eighty percent supplies the posterior wall. So you got this big list here. But what you want to remember is when I have a patient who presents with changes in two, three, and AVF. I'm going to be aware that they may also be infarcting their right ventricle. And there will be a question about inferior MI with right ventricular dysfunction. That's probably me, actually. Oh, no, that's not me. That's you. Okay. All right. Very good. So right ventricular dysfunction correlates oftentimes with a pure inferior. We're thinking it's just the inferior LV, but the patient's infarcted their right ventricle. Everybody okay with that? Right coronary artery supplies inferior wall of the LV and the right ventricle. So the words here will be patient has a proximal lesion of the right coronary. The closer to the aorta, meaning the closer to the cusp where the uh, artery originates, the more that patient's involved. Everybody, uh, more myocardium's involved. The higher the lesion, the more proximal the lesion. Okay, and very important to appreciate as well that you have one other division of your electrical activation that's called the posterior left bundle. The right coronary artery supplies that. That's the most important one. It's the biggest stalk. It's the most uh, rigorous component of the left bundle is the back wall, posterior left bundle. Okay. Also, right coronary artery supplies the back papillary muscle. So everybody remember what the papillary muscle is? Papillary muscle is the muscle that is embedded into the ventricular wall that holds the cord that keeps the valve closed. When I rupture the papillary muscle, my mitral valve or my tricuspid valve will actually regurgitate. Okay. So very important for us to appreciate that muscle often gets ruptured with an LAD. It's the anterior muscle. When I have a patient who has an infra posterior, again, very sophisticated, but just remember that with a right coronary lesion, if it's proximal, prox proximal, I may actually rupture the back muscle, the papillary muscle, okay? So that's really important. And the right coronary artery supplies primarily the sinus node and the AV junction, okay? So if the right coronary artery supplies the sinus node, when my patient comes into... <coughs> into the emergency department, oh, sorry. <clears throat> or is admitted into the ICU post cath what I know I'm gonna look for if they have a right coronary lesion and inferior MI, I know I'm gonna look for first degree block, right? 
So a prolongation of the PR interval, but I'm also going to look for second degree block. Typically with an RCA, you will see Mobitz type one, which is, what's the other word? Winkabach. Good. With, so again, the clinical judgment piece is, oh, I see inferior changes on the EKG. You have a prolonged PR interval. Oh, all of a sudden it's progressively prolonging. Oh, I'm not surprised. I expected that because it's the right coronary lesion, right? So that's the tree you have to understand. Inferior MI, first degree, maybe second degree, type one MOBITs. Type two MOBITs and complete heart block typically occurs with an LAD lesion. Good, everybody good? So our clinical judgment piece is gonna be really, really important here. Okay, so just reminding you about lead placement as you look at this visual and you're looking at the visual of this patient and what you're actually seeing here is that is how the leads are placed when we're talking about at the bedside. We're not talking about with our 12 lead EKG. The only difference with the 12 lead EKG is that we're not using the chest for the limb lead placement. Okay, so first and foremost, we're just thinking about how we place our leads on our patient. And for- I'm cardiac... sorry, Ms. Barbara, we don't see a patient. We still see coronary circulation with four vessels. Okay. That I can't help. Do you see it now? It, it's no, just a there chest. Can... It's not a patient. It's just a chest. Oh, okay. Is there a way you can point your camera to the screen that you're looking at? Because all we see is you and in the same part. I, I can't. I've, I've got like all sorts of attachments here. So no, I can't. Okay, gotcha. That's fine. I, Thank you. I mean, you can see, you can look at the screen. You can't really see anything. See how I turned it to the screen? Okay, so uh, I'm not, you know, I, I, it's just, unfortunately, this is just not rigorous enough to actually do all those displays. So the only thing I can do is come off Zoom and come back on Zoom. And that would mean you all would have to sign in again. If you want to try that, we can do it. You want to try that? Actually, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to turn off my camera, actually. And you're not going to be able to see me, but I think that might actually help. So hang on a second. Okay. Let me turn off my camera. Okay. And let's see if that helps. How's that? Can you see it? Guys? Yes, we see the chest. The chest. Okay, so you're not gonna okay, be able so to see. You're not, you're gonna, not gonna, be gonna be able to see. Okay, go ahead and mute yourself. You're mm -hmm. not gonna be able to see me, but you'll see the slide, okay? Okay, that's all we can do because it's just too much output for the computer. I'm so sorry. All right, so we found out Thank what you. to do. You are so welcome, my friend. And I will try to make sure you're understanding me by my words, even though you can't see me. This group who's here, they get to see me. Poor things. Okay, all right, my friends. So looking at this and thinking about your patient, your patient's chest, right? This is the way your leads are placed, okay? Right arm, left arm, right leg, left leg, and the chest leads. When you're at the bedside, you're using a five lead cable. You can only look at one chest lead at a time. That's using that brown electrode, okay? But what I want you to appreciate here, okay, so what I've done is I've encircled V3 and V4 with this green box. What does V3 and V4 look at? What wall? Anterior, good, anterior. You've got to know that. Okay, I put the heart inside there so you can appreciate that the EKG leads are building a visualization around the heart. Okay, I'm really looking at the anterior wall. Please mute yourself, everyone on the call. Okay, down here, the green arrow is showing you a visualization that looks up at the inferior wall. The leads that look at inferior wall, two, three, AVF. Okay, so this is something you have to memorize. You should know this anyway for clinical practice. Two, three, AVF, inferior. The letter F tells you it's inferior. Okay. 
And all, please mute, please mute yourself, everyone. Please mute yourself. Okay. Two, three, and AVF, inferior. Anything that has, okay, I can't really see all the participants right now because I turned that off. Guys, remember, you need to mute yourself. Please check yourself. You've got two people who are talking. Please check yourself and mute yourself, please. Thank you. Okay, so one and L using that left arm electrode, that's high lateral, okay? V1 and V2, anteroceptal, V5 and 6, low lateral. So remember, this is not simulation. You're not going to be putting leads on a patient. You just have to memorize this. You have to memorize it. When you look at a 12 lead EKG on an exam or in your clinical practice, you are going to divide your leads into lead groups. Two, three AVF, inferior. One and in L, high lateral. V5 and six, low lateral. V1 and two, septal. V3 and four, anterior. And we're going to come back to that again. And I have a table. So don't worry. I got a table for you. No worries. Okay. So understanding where your leads are looking, understanding the coronary circulation, if you appreciate that, it's going to help you so much with your clinical judgment piece. Okay, that's really, really, really profoundly important. Good? All right. So now we're going to go to ACS. Acute coronary syndrome is a term that embraces many types of events that have to do with alterations of coronary circulation. So it's always about, when we say ACS, it's always about an investigation of the coronary circulation, okay? And it's just a generalized term that says, I have a patient who is presenting with a clinical, uh, a clinical context, chest pressure, chest pain, radiation, nausea, vomiting, diaphoresis, electrical abnormalities. I'm going to investigate them for ACS. ACS means I have a couple things underneath that that I'm going to investigate, okay? So acute coronary syndrome is about the circulation, and I'm now going to investigate the circulation. It typically means that there is some alteration in the blood flow through the coronary vessels to the myocardium. Myocardium is always working. The electrical component and the mechanical component are both highly oxygen dependent. So the only way oxygen gets there is on the back of blood flow, right? Everybody's with that. We all got that. So if there's an interruption in the blood flow, then the myocardium is at risk. Okay, now we're going to think about a lot of things that can occur that interrupt coronary circulation, but the one we really want to look at is the one that we think of the most, which is going to be stemming. That ends up with an electrical abnormality that tells us we've got a problem. Okay, so when we're thinking about this acute coronary syndrome, what is vitally and profoundly important is to remember the difference between stable and unstable. Unstable coronary disease is typically associated with not just atherosclerosis, which is typically stable. Atherosclerosis is stable. So a narrowing of the vessel because of an atherosclerotic disorder is typically stable. What happens is if that atherosclerotic plaque causes a rupture in the internal lining of the blood vessel, that rupture then promotes a thrombus. And the thrombus 
acutely occludes the vessel. So the reason we do a stand is we want to stabilize that rupture. The reason you give heparin, the reason you give Plavix, and even though that's changing in the coronary world, it's changing right now, and it's changing your clinical practice, the test is going to be a little bit behind. They're always going to talk about heparin, and they're going to talk about Plavix. If I have a patient with unstable disease who has electrical abnormalities, my first goal is, first of all, I want to get them to the cath lab. But in the interim is I am going to try to prevent them from making more clot. That's what I'm doing with Plavix. And I'm going to try to control that clot size with heparin. Right? So I'm going to use heparin and Plavix because I've got a patient with an acute coronary syndrome and the word acute and then unstable means that I believe they have a, they have a plaque rupture. And it's the plaque rupture which I'm most concerned about. And of course, out of acute coronary syndrome is unstable angina, non-STEMI, and STEMI. The worst of which is STEMI. Doesn't mean non-STEMI is not worrisome and non-STEMI can progress. Okay, so we wanna talk about those three things, unstable angina, sorry, unstable angina, non-STEMI and STEMI, but our focus is gonna be on STEMI. I just want to make sure you appreciate unstable angina, typical chest presentation, no evidence of muscle loss. All right, I'm going to say that again, then I'm going to ask you a question. Okay. Unstable angina, typical presentation of acute coronary syndrome, chest discomfort, et cetera, not predictable EKG changes. but no evidence of muscle loss. What is the evidence? So remember, number one is clinical presentation. Got to have a clinical presentation. I'm nauseated, I'm vomiting, I'm diaphoretic. I can't walk to my mailbox. I woke up in the middle of the night with crushing chest discomfort, shortness of breath. I come to the emergency room. I've got a clinical context. Then I'm going to do two things. First one's going to be an EKG. And the second one is what? Troponin level. So when you lose myocardial muscle, when you lose tissue, the evidence of tissue loss is an increasing troponin. So with unstable angina, I've got the clinical picture. I do not have predictable EKG changes and I haven't lost muscle. Good, that's, that's all you really have to remember. Sounds like you're having an MI, but no predictable EKG changes and you're not losing muscle. You've got a clinical context, but nothing else. Everybody good, that's unstable angina. Now, let me make sure you appreciate, if you're lucky, you present with unstable angina. Why? Because now I can treat you and try to prevent evolution. Because unstable angina can actually progress to non-STEMI and non-STEMI can progress to STEMI. They're all part of the same continuum. Okay? So when you have unstable angina, we're going to treat you. We're just not taking you to the cath lab. We don't need to go to the cath lab. You're not losing muscle. Right? We are going to take you to the cat lab really fast when you're losing muscle because we want to stop the loss of muscle. If you stay at home with chest discomfort for seven hours, you come into the hospital, your troponin is 48 times normal. You've already lost muscle. Guess what? You're going into heart failure. And that's going to be sustained heart failure because what have you done? You have lost muscle, exactly. So unstable angina, remember the three components. You got the clinical context, non-predictable EKG changes, which means no ST segment elevation and not particularly satisfying, and no elevation in troponin. Okay, that's really important. Okay, 
So I'll come back here. I'm sure I say it again, I probably do. I don't have my slides memorized in my head, so it probably will come again, it's okay. It doesn't hurt us. Okay. Non-STEMI, I have the clinical context. Just remember, check all three of those boxes. When you're looking at a situation in real life on a test, all three boxes, clinical presentation, EKG changes, muscle loss, muscle wasting, troponin. And that helps you in your clinical practice as well, very much in your clinical practice. Okay, non-stemming, clinical context, diffuse EKG changes, no STEMI, no ST elevation, but now you are spilling muscle. Small amounts, but you are spilling muscle. So the difference between unstable angina and non-STEMI, evidence of muscle lysis. Good? So again, you're looking at an exam and you're, you're taking a test and the question says, oh, his troponin's elevated. He has nonspecific EKG changes, but chest pain, but nonspecific ST segment changes, which means not ST elevation. That's why they call it non-STEMI. Now there's a new name, but AACN and CCRN will still call it non-STEMI. Okay. But you're lysing muscle. So troponin's up, clinical context, but no ST segment elevation. That's a non-STEMI. Are you worried about non-STEMI? Yes, because it's on the journey to STEMI. So we're going to treat you, but we don't have to activate you to go to the cath lab right now. So it's going to be considered urgent, but not emergent, unless unless the clinical context continues to get worse and doesn't improve with our therapy, then we're going to take you emergently. Okay, everybody good? So start with unstable, then to non-STEMI. What's the difference between the two? The presence of troponin, good, muscle loss, and then STEMI. STEMI means clinical context, predictable EKG changes with ST elevation and muscle loss. So the clinical content is... The clinical content is... The clinical context is I'm presenting with traditional signs and symptoms of acute coronary syndrome. So, right, there's so many of them. But the common ones we think about are chest pressure, radiation to the jaw, the left arm, shortness of breath, diaphoresis, nausea, vomiting. All of that comes, and there's others as well, but those are the primary ones. So you've got a clinical picture. You climbed a ladder. You got very, very significant chest pressure. You could barely breathe. You had to sit down on the ground. It did not resolve. EMS is called. You've still got that. And in the truck, they do a EKG. Now in the truck, they're looking for specific EKG changes. Okay, if you got ST elevation in the truck with that context, we already know your troponin is probably going to be elevated. Unless you did cocaine, then you might not have an elevated troponin because you're just vasospasming. You don't necessarily have a rupture of a plaque. Okay, so there are a lot of things that present that way, right? But we are going to, if you come into the ECC and you've got clinical context, ST segment elevation and evidence of troponin, you're going to the cath lab. Sometimes we don't even wait for troponin. We just see the ST elevation. So those are the three things that are part of STEMI, right? Again, remember, we just want a basic pathway of clinical judgment. There's a lot else to think about. You've got the clinical context, you have ST segment elevation, and you've got an elevated troponin. You're having a STEMI. That's the worst of the acute coronary syndrome. Why? Because muscle is dying every second. And as your muscle dies every second, you progress further and further into a lifetime of heart failure. And our goal is to stop it so you don't lose so much muscle mass that you now live in class three to class four heart failure, praying for a heart transplant. And if you're part of our population, which is not to do with the CCRN exam, because they're going to they're gonna produce equ equity in clinical practice in a very unreal examination world. 
But in the real world, when you work with patients who are impoverished, come from a culture of poverty, who don't have a home, cannot assure that they can take medications, they are not going to get a heart transplant. We're going to try really hard to get a heart transplant for those patients, but they are not going to be high on the transplant list. So there's tremendous inequity. AACN doesn't see that. They, I mean, they know it's real, but on the exam, they're not looking at inequity practice. So just remember, your goal is to protect your patient from that progression on their journey from UA, unstable angina, to non-STEMI, to STEMI, to massive muscle loss, which then leads to class three or class four heart failure. Because class three to class four heart failure, class three we can manage with medications, but as they progress to class four, really they need a VAD as a bridge and a transplant. Otherwise class four is a terminal disease like terminal cancer. And patients can go home and they can live for a year, maybe two. They mostly live in bed. It's very similar to having cancer. That is in your hands, my friends. That is in your hands. And on the exam, it's in your hands by that early recognition. In reality, it's really in your hands by making sure you're measuring troponins and you're measuring them correctly so that we're actually looking at muscle lysis because that's really important to us, okay? All right, so when we talk about STEMI, the thing that tells us that you're having a STEMI is whether or not there is ST segment elevation on your EKG. That's all. You've got the clinical context, you're spilling troponin, but we're gonna call it a STEMI versus a non-STEMI if you have ST segment elevation, that's all. It's really straightforward, don't let it feel Worrisome, it's really straightforward. You got to have ST segment elevation. Again, on the exam, it's going to be obvious. They're not going to ask you to be discrete cardiologists or high level interpreters of EKG. You're going to look at a 12 lead EKG. And if the patient's having a STEMI, it's going to be obvious because they're going to have ST segment elevation. Okay, so that's really important. Now, when we talk about our patients and how they present, it's really important to remember that patients present with a cycle. The only patients you're going to need to evaluate are going to be on, on exam are patients who have ST segment elevation. But what I want you to know here is if you look at letter A and then you look at letter E, look at A and look at E. That's the same patient. What's really important for us to recognize and to understand about an EKG is EKG just looks at current in the heart. You got to have a big muscle to conduct a lot of current. When you're not conducting current, the current goes away from where your electrode is. So what that tells you is that over time, you went from letter A to letter E, and you can see that that downward wave, that's called the Q wave, that Q wave got bigger. That's because as current travels towards my, pot, my electrode, and it's the positive electrode is current goes towards the positive electrode, the picture will be upright. And as current goes away from the positive electrode, the current will be downward. The development of Q waves. So look at letter A, you have a tiny teeny Q, that's a normal Q. And then you look at letter E, you got a great big Q. The development of a Q wave means you have lost muscle. The Q wave indicates that you've lost muscle. The Q wave plus ST segment elevation means you are losing muscle right now. So what am I going to do? If you are losing muscle right now, heparin, plavix, cath lab, heparin, plavix, cath lab. And by the way, you never stop going to the cath lab because you didn't give heparin or plavix. So you're going to give heparin and plavix if you have time. And if you don't, no problem. You're going to the cath lab. You're going to the cath lab as soon as possible. If you have ST segment elevation, if you have ST segment elevation plus a Q wave, if you have a big Q wave and no ST segment elevation, you're finished. You've already done it. It's already over with. We might take you to the cath lab, but it's not emergent because you've already infarcted. Once you've already infarcted, it's likely you're going to go into heart failure. And the level of heart failure is going to determine whether or not that's cardiogenic shock. Cool? Does that make sense to everybody? You're feeling pretty good with what I've said? Okay, excellent, perfect. 
Okay. So when we talk about STEMI, there's a couple of things that are really important. Okay. Don't worry about the age and all that. That's, that's okay. Don't even worry about the height because again, that's more discreet than you need for your exam. The only thing you need is that you have ST segment elevation in at least two leads of a lead group. So that means I might have ST segment elevation lead two, but not in lead three or AVF. I'm not going to consider that STEMI. Got to be two leads. Okay, two leads of the lead group. So again, you've got to memorize your lead groups. So lateral, one LV5 and six. Inferior, two, three and AVF. Anteroceptal, V1 and two. Pure anterior, V3 and four. You have to know that. You have, that's something you do have to memorize. You've got to have that in your head. If you don't know that and you're asked a question, you're going to get confused. Okay. At least two leads of the lead group that's looking at the surface area of the heart. Okay. We're not going to worry about the bundle branch block. We're not going to worry about the posterior MI that's more advanced than ASN is going to ask you because they don't want you to be an expert in 12 ADKG. They just want you to recognize STEMI and identify the area at risk. Okay, so again, inferior, what leads? No V. Okay, just, just no, hang on. Just remember F stands for inferior. Two, three, and AVF, inferior. Two, three, and AVF, inferior. High lateral, just, just general lateral. Okay, so she didn't mean to say V1. She meant to say lead one. I know that I know her, so I know what she was saying. Lead one in AVL. That's the possible electrode on the left arm. V5 and six. Those are lateral. Anterior. Good. Antroceptal. Rach. Antroceptal. Antroceptal leads. V1 and V2. You can phone a friend. Don't forget. You've got to be able to know that. You, you know, you have a little cards. Sometimes you have cards on your badge. You're not going to have a card. You've got to know lead placement like the back of your hand. Okay? Lateral, 1L, V5 and 6. Inferior, 2, 3 and AVF. Anterior, V3 and 4. Anteroceptal, V1 and 2. And oftentimes with an anterior MI, you've got changes in V2, V3, V4, V5 because you're extending your anterior infarct to the septum and to the lateral wall. You have to know your lead groups. That you have to memorize. I can teach it to you again and again, but you've got to memorize it. And it needs to be pretty comfortable because in order to identify EKG changes on an exam and on your patient, you should know that, okay? Three said it can extend into five and six. Anything that's lateral okay. can extend either to the septum uh, anything, I'm sorry, that's anterior can extend into the septum, anteroseptum, or into the lateral wall. So it's not, uh, if I have a patient with an anterior MI, I don't expect to see only changes in V3 and 4. I'm typically going to see some extension over to the lateral wall, that will be 5 and 6, or into the septal wall, that will be 1 and 2. Okay? All right, now here's just some coloration, okay? So what you're looking at here is... Excuse one me, L five and six, that's lateral. Okay. Two. Hey Barbara. Three. Yes. Pardon me. Yes. Uh, yes. Which slide are you on? Because uh, oh. we're still seeing uh, the chest leads. Slide thirteen. Can you? Uh, are you? Thank you. Fourteen. You see it? Thirteen. I'm on thirteen. Slide thirteen. Do you see it? Now we do, yes. Uh, okay. it, well, it wasn't following along. Thank you. Yep. It's just, this is a very, very, very intensive to do it real time and virtual. Thank you, everybody, gotcha. for understanding. Okay, very good. Okay, so you see in the colors, okay? So 2, 3, and ABF, that tends to be inferior, and that's related to the RCA. The RCA also supplies the sinus node and the AV junction. So what are you going to expect? a first degree AV block and perhaps a Mobitz type one. Good clinical judgment, okay? Lead one, 
AVL, V5 and 6 are lateral, and that's generally related to the circumflex, which may also present with a first degree AV block. What is that? One L, V5 and 6 correlated to the circumflex coronary vessel, which supplies 45% of the sinus node. So you may also see a first degree AV block here. Anterior. So now we're kind of looking at uh, anterior extension. Antroseptum, V1 and 2. Pure anterior, V3 and 4. Okay. Those are your leads. With an anterior lesion, you're going to expect to see a right and or a left bundle branch block. That's with your LAD, LAD. So you're gonna see changes in the anterior wall, but you may also see a right and or left, bundle, partial left bundle branch block, a partial one. Because if you have a complete left bundle branch block and a complete right bundle branch block, guess what, you're dead, right? Because you're not conducting current. So it's a partial left bundle because there's two divisions of the left bundle. Okay, on your exam, you'll either see a pure right bundle or you see a pure left bundle. That's all you'll see. There's no one's going to ask you to do any other differentiation. Okay, right bundle or left bundle. That's it. Cool? Okay. So, so with a left anterior descending or a left main, which is the preceder to the LAD, what you may also see is Mobitz type 2 or complete heart block. Mobitz type 2 or complete heart block with a LAD or a left main. So left main means before it splits, you should expect to see Mobitz type 2 and or transition into complete heart block. Mobitz type 2 or complete heart block. Okay. Everybody's had an advanced dysrhythmia course? Yes? No? Basic dysrhythmia, basic, okay, good. It's usually a basic class doesn't go very in depth into heart block. So we are gonna have some discussion about heart blocks. That's in cardiology three, okay? Okay, so don't worry. You'll be able to recognize and you're gonna have a very easy way to do it. I promise you that, my friends. All right, so very good. Everybody feels pretty good so far? So when I look at your EKG and you have ST segment elevation in V3, V4, V5, what am I calling that? Anterior, inferior, or lateral? V3, V4, V5. What am I calling? Anterior, do I have lateral involvement? Yes. What am I going to look for? Oh, more changes now in V6 and 1 and L because I've extended to the lateral wall, but it's primarily anterior. Good. What do I expect? You might have Mobitz type 2, complete heart block. Do I need to get you to the cath lab? Yeah, you got ST segment elevation, right? ST segment elevation, at least two leads of the lead group. Excellent, excellent. My patient comes in, 60-year-old diabetic woman. Diabetic and women don't present normally. She's just nauseated and vomiting on questioning. She says, yeah, I've been really tired today. I feel I'm having a little trouble breathing. We get her EKG and what we see is ST segment elevation in leads two and three. What am I anticipating that is? Inferior. inferior. And with inferior, can I expect to see that you might have prolonged PR interval, first degree AV block? Yes. Can I expect that you might actually progress to Mobitz type one, which is progressive prolongation of the PR interval and then a non-conducted P wave, correct? Okay. Do I want to get you to the cath lab? Yes. Okay, good. Got to memorize your leads. Got to look at those changes. Got to know that expression. Doesn't make you an expert in 12 lead evaluation. That's not what you need. Just need to be able to look at this and say, I know what to anticipate. And with my clinical judgment, I'm going to observe this. Okay. With an inferior MI, this will always be a question. Would you give your patient nitroglycerin? No. Okay, I heard you. You said no, you said no. I don't know what the people on the call are doing, but they're, they're okay. How about the rest of you? Yes or no? Would you give your patient nitroglycerin? 
I'm not saying not ever. I'm saying immediately. Immediately, would you consider nitroglycerin? You're, some folks are saying yes. Other folks are saying nothing because they're not sure what the answer is, which is okay. Right coronary artery supplies the inferior wall, but it also supplies the right ventricle. The right ventricle is a volume pump. So when you give nitroglycerin, you dilate the veins, which means the volume that goes back to the right heart goes down, which means that you could cause your patient to go directly into cardiogenic shock, giving them nitroglycerin outside of direction, and most significantly, after volume resuscitation. So with an inferior MI, the choice will never be to give nitroglycerin until somebody has evaluated the patient fully. Doesn't mean you'll never give them nitro, but you're not gonna do it immediately because it can cause them to go directly into cardiogenic shock, okay? That's always a question. It's always a question, <laughs> okay? All right, beautiful. Okay, so now just remember when we talk about STEMI, what STEMI means is that the occlusion in my vessel has caused a loss of the muscle wall from the internal lining, the endothelium, to the external layer, which is the epithelium. So it's a, what we used to call years and years ago, full wall thickness. You've lost all the way through the wall, which is why that current changes. It has to be fully through the wall for you to get an S2 segment elevation. Might be a very small area, but it's fully from the Epithelium to the endothelium. You've lost full wall. That's what gives you a STEMI. A non-STEMI is partial wall. It's a progressive, right? UA, non-STEMI, STEMI. UA, non-STEMI, STEMI. Our goal is to stop you at UA. Our goal is to stop you at non-STEMI. Our goal at STEMI is to limit the amount of muscle you've lost. Pretty straightforward. Stop threatening your muscle is the goal. With UA, I haven't lost muscle yet. With a non-STEMI, I've lost muscle, but not full wall. With STEMI, I've lost the whole wall of the muscle mass. Okay? So really, really, really important when we're thinking about that. Okay? So really, really important when we're thinking about that and the relationship. And then remember the biomarkers that tell me that I've lost muscle, the most important one is troponin. Okay, so we look at basic troponin levels, focus on basic troponin levels. I, I, I haven't taken the test this last year. I take it about every five years. By the way, I got a pin yesterday, which I meant to wear today. I got my 35 year CCRN pin, 35 years. So I take the test, <laughs> thank you. I take the test every other renewal because I wanna be aware of what's on the test. When I first took the test, it was like medical boards. It was like an MCAT. They didn't care about how you cared about your patient. They didn't care about psychosocial. They didn't care about sleep. They didn't care about family. It was all physiology and pathophysiology. The test has evolved. Much less physiology and pathophysiology and a lot more about caring, okay? But just letting you know, I was like in the, probably in the third round of nurses to take the CCRN exam because I took it like in 19, what, 35 years. So 1990, 1988, 1990, somewhere around there. 19, I can't really even remember. It was a long time ago. Oh. And actually, I think I had it even before that. And then I let it lapse because I was like making $7,000 a year working at Mass General. I could barely buy peanut butter, much less pay for an exam. And my hospital didn't do it. So I think I had it even before that, but I, 35 years continuously. All right, I meant to wear that pin today. It was so important, but I forgot it. In the rush out of the house, I left my badge and my CCRN pin. Oh my God. But you guys know who I am. Okay, so let's hope that this is gonna play for everyone. This is a very simple kind of video. Sorry for the music, but I kind of have to keep the music on so that everybody can hear me. This is the most fantastic video. If you've taken my 12 lead class or my cardiac boot camp, you've seen it before. It's a fantastic video because it just reminds us what happens. And here's our patient. And now we're going into his heart. And now we're gonna look at his vascular structure. 
So as we go into his vascular structure, what we're going to see is the deposition of the LDL and the cholesterol deposed underneath the endothelial lining. Okay, so that's where your atherosclerotic disease forms. And what it does is it causes a thinning of the endothelial lining, which means that the weight of the plaque can cause a rupture. When you rupture, you aggregate platelets because now you have protein communicating with blood and that's what aggregates your platelets. So you were really lucky when you have atherosclerotic disease and we discover that and we give you a stent to control it. Hopefully you're not gonna rupture your plaque. When you rupture this thin core, you rupture that, the rapidity of platelet aggregation, thrombus formation can completely occlude your vessel. So this is typically what we're seeing. When we see a patient with STEMI, it's not just their plaque. It has to have ruptured. And now they've got complete occlusion and that is threatening the distal muscle. And that's what shows you ST segment elevation. If the muscle dies, you then will develop an extraordinary Q wave. Q wave means dead muscle. Q wave must be wider than 0.04 seconds and deeper than two millimeters to actually represent that we've lost muscle, okay? And then the last thing we're gonna see here is basically sudden cardiac death. Sudden cardiac death typically occurs with a uh, left main or a proximal LAD. So the same process, rupturing the endothelium, aggregating platelets, occluding blood flow, and distal to that, no electrical activity. Because if it's a left main, I've lost both right and full left bundle. So I have no electrical communication. That's what happens to a lot of people. They come out of a restaurant, they drop dead. They have sudden cardiac death. I think that's one of the best videos in the world that just explains to us and gives us a really nice visualization. All right, it's gonna take a minute to get out of this. I don't know why. There we go. Hopefully, guys, you can see it. Just one person unmute. Fabici, unmute. Can you see physical findings? No sleeping, Fabici. Okay, I'm going to assume that acquiescence. We can't, we can't see it. You can't see it. Okay, thank you. Fabici is sleeping. All right. Can you see it now? Thank you, we can see it. Okay, what I think, I'm gonna see if I, if I stay in this view. Okay, so let me just try to make it as big as possible. I think when I'm running the whole slide program, it may be an issue, I, I don't know. So let me just try that. I'll do whatever I can to try to make it work for everybody. And I appreciate that the audience who is here is being very tolerant. Okay. All right, so maybe this will work, maybe it won't, we'll just see. Okay, all right, so again, what, again, now this is gonna be really important because this is part of what ACN is gonna do is they're gonna give you some physical descriptions. Okay, so number one, when we think about evaluating our patients, we always wanna take our fingers, two fingers, mid-clavicular line, fifth intercostal space. We put our fingers there and that's where we expect to feel. So on the left side of the patient, fifth intercostal space, mid-clavicular line, that's called the point of maximal impulse. That's where the biggest muscle mass of the myocardium begins its contraction. We begin the contraction at the apex of the heart and I should feel that pulsate at the point of maximal impulse, PMI. If I'm having a big anterior infarct, that's going to shift left. So one of the big describers is the PMI is shifted two centimeters to the left. Okay, that means anterior. That almost always means anterior. I've lost my anterior muscle. I've lost my apex. It shifts to the left. Point of maximal impulse shifts to the left. Now, in our clinical practice, let me be sure you appreciate, it is incredibly difficult to differentiate heart sounds. We work in noisy environments. Some of us have lousy stethoscopes. 
it's really hard to differentiate heart sounds. It's very easy on a test to say the patient has an S3 or an S3, S4 gallop. On a test, it's easy to say it. In reality, it's hard to hear. Doesn't mean you're not trying, just means you probably aren't gonna hear it. I mean, have you ever, you know, I can't even hear people talk when I'm in the emergency room, it's so noisy there, right? So we're just not in such a, a, an environment where, and none of us in the world, except in a real true cardiac unit where everything is quiet and the lights are low and everybody's talking like this. It's really lovely. And as long as your patient doesn't have a balloon pump, a ventilator and pellet, you know, they're just laying in the bed, they're not ventilated. You can probably hear their heart sounds. And you can probably hear heart sounds in the cardiac clinic. In an ICU examination, very unlikely you're gonna hear them, but they're gonna be described for you. So just wanna remind you very simply about heart sounds. It's right, lub and dub. Lub and dub tell you valves have closed. That's all. That's what they tell you. Lub and dub tell you that valves have closed. Lub correlates with S1. That's the S1 heart sound. That's the beginning of systole. The valves that close at the beginning of systole are mitral and tricuspid. You are going to have to know this. Mitral and tricuspid give us the S1 sound. If mitral and tricuspid are closed, aortic and pulmonic are open. S1, mitral tricuspid closed, aortic pulmonic open. Beginning of systole, first event of systole. S1, beginning of systole. Mitral tricuspid valves closed, aortic pulmonic open. S2, is the end of systole or the beginning of diastole. What valves are closed? Aortic. Aortic and pulmonic. And what valves are open? Mitral and tricuspid. So first and foremost, if you just remember that, it's going to make it much easier for you. Okay. S1, mitral tricuspid closed, aortic pulmonic open. Beginning of systole. S2, Aortic pulmonic closed, mitral and tricuspid are open. Beginning of diastole. Everybody good? Okay. So again, it's a test. So you're not really listening, right? Abnormal heart sounds, we're going to categorize into two categories. Murmurs and cardiac sounds. Filling sounds. Okay. Murmurs happen at S1 or S2 right? And they may last all of or part of the cycle. S3 and S4 are heart sounds, so they sound like lub dub. They just occur during diastole, okay? So normally I hear lub dub, lub dub, lub dub, S1, S2, lub dub, lub dub, systole, 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 S1, S2. I've got a nice normal heart rate, 60, lub dub, Lub dub, diastole. Lub dub, diastole. And then I have a stiff heart, which is what happens when I'm ischemic. My heart gets stiff. So now, when the blood flows from the atria to the ventricle through the open mitral and tricuspid valves, I'm going to get another sound. That first one that you hear is S3. Lub dub. Lub dub, let me change it. Lub dub, filling. Lub dub, filling. Lub dub, filling. Lub dub dub, lub dub dub, lub dub dub, diastole filling S3. Stiff heart. S3 indicates the heart is stiff and it occurs early in filling, early in diastole, following the S2. Lub dub, filling. Lub dub, filling, lub dub, filling, lub lub dub, lub lub dub, lub lub dub, S4. At the very end of diastole, just before S1, S4 indicates the heart is full. 
and stiff. S3, the heart is empty and stiff. S4, the heart is full and stiff. A stiff heart is a hypertrophied heart or an ischemic heart. So in description on your exam, it will say you have changes, ST segment elevation, V3, V4, and V5. You have a displacement of your PMI, two centimeters to the left, and you hear an S3, S4 gallop and mitral regurgitation. Did you expect that? In the face of the fact that you had ST segment elevation, V3, V4, V5, did you expect this? Yes or no? Yes, because your heart is ischemic. It's dying. And you hear all these abnormal sounds. Okay? <laughs> cool? Okay, good. All right. <laughs> It means that as your muscle dies, the functional muscle, so I'm infarcting that anterior muscle. If I'm infarcting it, is it contracting? No. So point of maximal impulse shifts because dead muscle, my dear, does not conduct current and it does not contract, which is the whole problem. Dead tissue does not conduct current. That's why I see a Q wave. And all around it, I see that ST segment elevation. Okay, again, beyond our purpose here. And it's not contracting. And that's why I used to feel it right here, but now I've lost that muscle underneath my fingers. That muscle is stunned or it's dead. And it might just be stunned, which is why I'm getting you to the cath lab right away. I'm not waiting a half an hour. Oh, you, I'll have to wait till you're done with rounds. Okay. Yeah, I'm just a little nurse. I'm not going to actually argue. No, no, get here right now. And if you're not getting here right now, I'm calling rapid response. And then I'm going to call cardiology because I've got a patient who's infarcting. I'm not waiting for your six hour rounds for you to come and see the patient, right? You got to come right now. You thought that was funny because you know it's the truth. Okay, you got to come right now. No, I think whenever you call anybody about a patient with chest pain, ST segment changes, they come running for sure. They always come on. I'm just making a joke to lighten the mood, wake a few people up, making sure everybody's okay. All right. So really good, really important when we're thinking about that patient. The anterior wall isn't moving. Okay. So we got to make sure we appreciate it. Normally, the biggest muscle mass right here, anterior and apex, is the best contractor. That's why I feel it. But when it is being threatened, because it doesn't have blood flow and therefore oxygen, it's starting to die. Does dead tissue contract? Okay, so it's, the fact is, it's not that it's actually moving. It's that when I put my fingers here, I'm not feeling that contraction because that tissue is stunned or it is already dead. Is that good? Thank you for that great question. I appreciate that question so much. All right, guys, can you see that I've moved to the next one? So just let me know, yes or no, one yes, person. Yes, thank you. Yes. Okay, good. I think we just have to run it in this scenario. Okay, so whenever I have a patient who has these presentations, they may have some changes that make me think that it is a STEMI because I might have diffuse ST segment elevation. Diffuse ST segment elevations means it might be two leads in one lead group, one lead in another, and it's gonna be all across the percord, it's all across the heart. So it's in multiple lead groups all at the same time, it's diffuse. Pericarditis. That pain, by the way, seems like chest pain if you're not asking the right questions, okay? It's sharp pleuritic pain. Patient cannot lay down. Well, that sounds like heart failure, right? So that's not a really great differentiation. Okay. But it's worse with breathing. So that's always going to be important. That's going to be your key. The key will be patient says they have this sharp pain and it gets worse when they breathe. Okay. Not a STEMI. 
on a test, not a STEMI. It gets worse when they breathe. Okay. They have ST segment elevation. It's easy to jump quickly to STEMI. But read the description. Read the question. It gets worse when they take a breath. You ask them to take a deep breath, it gets much worse. Okay. That's not a STEMI. Okay, so that's really, really important. Now, pericarditis, remember, is an inflammatory disorder, and it is going to cause some alterations. But the alterations are not focused. They are unfocused. They're global. They're global changes, okay? Aortic dissection oftentimes can get confused very initially for a STEMI, but they don't have EKG changes. And their pain is typically front to back. So not necessarily to the jaw or to the left arm, it's front to back. It's also very significant because it goes from zero to severe. Unlike chest pain, which goes zero and then gets worse, this is zero to severe. One of the most important things, of course, with aortic dissection is the loss of pulses. On chest x-ray, of course, you're going to see that, that the aorta is dissecting. So you see that accumulation of blood in the dissected aorta, which gives you the widened mediastinum, which also causes a shift in the trachea. And again, no one's trying to make you into a surgeon. No one's trying to make you into a radiologist. It's going to be pretty straightforward. This was an instantaneous severe pain. The patient has a history of hypertension. It describes the pain as being front to back. What's the first thing you need? A chest x-ray. And to control his blood pressure. Okay? Cool? All right. Very good. Other differential diagnoses? PE. PE also has pleuritic pain. Okay? We're, the main thing with pulmonary embolism is index of suspicion. You're bed bound, you just had orthopedic surgery, you just took a 14 hour flight. So PE presents very similarly, PE doesn't present with ST segment elevation, but, but PE presents very similarly initially to STEMI and to pericarditis. But your index of suspicion is because of the presentation of the patient. Okay. And we're going we're gonna to think about those reasons for clotting that we call Virchow's triad, right? So always remind yourself, PE almost always initially is based on your index of suspicion. Would they have elevated troponin? PE. No, not usually. No. Well, pericarditis, I mean, on, an exam, let, on a test exam, okay? Let's be sure we appreciate. On a test exam, troponin would be normal. Troponin will be normal with PE. Troponin will be normal with pericarditis. That's not, I'm not saying in your clinical practice, that's always going to be true. But on an exam, you're not really seeing a patient. So you're going to get information that will clearly lead you to the diagnosis if you pay attention. Okay, cool. All right, very good. Okay, and then of course, one of the most common things that we see, esophageal reflux, right? That is one of the most common, okay? And remember, unless... Unless you are putting words in your patient's mouth, they will tell you what's happening. Are you having chest pain? Yes. Okay. Can you tell me about your discomfort? Can you show me where the discomfort is? So clinically, don't put words in the patient's mouth. Are you having chest pain? Yes, I'm having chest pain. That's why I'm here. What's wrong with you? Didn't you read the triage note? Didn't the ambulance driver tell you? My wife told you. What's wrong with you? I've got a gun. Watch out. I'm going to shoot you. Right? <laughs> I mean, seriously. Don't put words in a patient's mouth. Tell me about your discomfort. Okay. So a couple of things that are important. Pleuritic pain by patients will be identified by fingers. True myocardial dysfunction like STEMI, patients will use a fist or the palm in their hand. Hello, to identify where the discomfort is. Patients will show you, they will guide you. If you say, tell me about the discomfort, 
then you know we asked the PQRST, right? What made it start eating? What made it better, Maylock? What made it start eating? What made it better, Tums? Okay. Oh my not chest pains. Hurts terrible. I'm horrible. We're going to help you, but it's, I, I don't feel that you need to go to the cat lab, which is quite a relief, actually. Doesn't mean that that pain is any less severe. It just means that it's not cardiac, right? So that's what we're going to work for as we consider with our patients. Okay. All right. So now take a look at this EKG. In your mind, give a quick scan. Quick evaluation and tell me as you group your leads. So leads two, three, and ABF. Down at the bottom is a rhythm strip. This is the way EKGs present. One and L, V5 and six, and then anteroceptal V1, V2, and anterior V3 and V4. Do you see ST segment elevation? Okay, just because someone is the first person who answers and they're loud doesn't make them right. Okay, do you see ST segment elevation? No, not really. You see ST segment depression? Okay, you see depression. So you may be thinking, and again, AAC is not trying to trick you. This is not a STEMI. This is probably a non-STEMI. It could be unstable angina. They're not trying to trick you. They want to know, do you recognize a STEMI? And by the way, Rose may have seen some minor ST segment elevation. That might be true. But the ASCN is not going to make you do differential diagnosis on something that's not actually really viable. Okay? So for now, we're going to say, no, what we see really is ST segment depression in lead one and AVL, right? We're looking at lead one AVL, we have ST segment depression. The T wave is upright, but we have ST segment depression. Probably not a STEMI, probably not even myocardial, but they're not gonna ask you to make a differential on that. They're just gonna say, do you think this is a STEMI? No, we don't, okay? So we're gonna evaluate the patient. We're gonna make sure they're comfortable, but we're not activating a STEMI alert. Good, everybody good? Okay, so always look at your lead groups and look for your ST segment elevation. So again, you're gonna remember that signs and symptoms that point to myocardial infarction, very basic model. ST segment elevation in two contiguous leads. So at least two leads of the lead group. Okay. Now on the opposite wall, that's called reciprocal changes. Reciprocal changes mean on the opposite wall, you have ST segment depression. So when I'm looking at the heart and I'm thinking about the heart, I'm going to actually turn on my video here. Okay. Let's see if the video will come up and maybe it will and maybe it won't. Okay. Okay. So when I'm looking at the heart, I want you to think about the heart like a coffee cup. The bottom part of the coffee cup is pointing towards the left foot, okay? Lateral is the upside of the cup. Inferior is the downside of the cup. Lateral is the upside of the cup. Inferior is the downside of the cup. And in a basic 12 lead EKG, the only, on your exam, the only actual valuable reciprocal changes, meaning ST depression to ST segment elevation, are lateral and inferior. Otherwise, you're not going to really have any. That's what's so important. And that's why I kind of got taken out of the ACC guidelines. So if I'm having ST segment elevation in the lateral leads, I'm going to expect to see ST depression in the inferior leads. If I'm having ST segment elevation in the inferior leads, I'm going to expect to see ST depression in the lateral leads. That's what we call reciprocal. Those are really the only simple ones that we can see because everything that's anterior must be viewed posterior and everything that's posterior must be viewed anterior. Good, everybody good? All right, awesome, perfect, perfect, perfect.
Okay. Secondly, okay, significant means that ST segment elevation should be, I'm just going to give you just a general rule of thumb, two millimeters, which means in a standard EKG, which is the only thing you're going to get on your exam, at least two boxes, two boxes up. Okay. That's going to be considered significant. Two boxes up. Okay. And of course, just remember, you've got to remember what leads are in the lead group so you can always look at contiguous, okay? All right. So now we come back and we just take a look at our leads. Inferior, 2, 3, and AVF, anteroseptal V1 and 2, pure anterior V3 and 4, lateral V5 and 6, lateral 1 and L. The only group that has four electrodes, lateral. But I can have low lateral, which is V5 and 6. I can have high lateral, which is 1 and L. Or I can have full lateral, 1 L, V5 and 6. Because remember, it only has to be two leads in a lead group. Everybody good? Those are those contiguous leads. So again, we always want to think about that. And we want to quantify your ST segment elevation. Okay. So in general, the general rule of thumb here is from, not from your PR interval, but from the line just before the P wave, the line just before the P wave, that's called the TP interval, the line just before the P wave, you should always just draw a straight line through your EKG. Count how many boxes up or how many boxes down, and that's it. Don't do it from the PR interval. Because the PR interval, everybody knows the PR interval, right? Everybody's had basic EKG. So the PR interval actually will become depressed when you have pericarditis, and it can become depressed when you have a PE. So you don't want to use the PR interval to determine electrical um, static, electrical. You're going to take the line before the P wave, draw a straight line over, count the boxes above, count the boxes below. On your EKG, you won't be able to draw a line, but you're going to draw a line with your mind's eye. And you're looking at that EKG on your exam, and you're going to count the boxes up or the boxes down. Okay, good. And you're going to remember that the PR interval coves. It's very common to see that coving of the PR interval in pericarditis. You can also see it in PE. It's very significant in pericarditis. Is that instead of the PR, so having the P wave in a straight line, you have a P wave and then it goes kind of below the baseline and comes up into the QRS. And you've defined the baseline by the line before the P wave. Okay, good. So this patient hasn't lost his, he hasn't lost much of his myocardium. Okay, so does everybody remember how to identify a Q wave? Okay, so tell me how you identify a Q wave. Okay, no. Okay, well, I love you, but no. Okay, tell me how you're looking at your EKG and identifying whether or not you have a Q wave, first of all. Okay, didn't you just say the word Q? No, you're doing good, you're doing good. Okay. I, I love that. Okay, it's not depression. Depression is talking about the ST segment or we're talking about the PR segment, right? We don't use the word depression when we're talking about electrical activation of the ventricle. So just, you, you had a fantastic explanation. I just want to change a few of your words, okay? But it was a fantastic explanation and you clearly told me that you know how to do it. Okay, when you look at the EKG, you think about the segment of all electrical activation and return. P wave, atria activated. PR segment, which is between the P wave and the QRS, atrial rest. QRS is ventricular activation. Always identify the R. The R means it is electrical activation out of a QRS. You have an upward deflection. So I don't want to use the words positive and negative because I think that is confusing. You have an upright. If you have an upright, that is always an R. Always, always an R. If it's upright, it's an R. If you look in front of the R, this is what you were saying, which was excellent. Looking in front of the R, if it's downwards, 
you might call that negative or negative deflection, it's a Q wave. If it's after the R, it's an S wave. The majority of patients do not have QRS. They have an R wave. They might have an RS. They normally don't have QRS, even though we use that terminology. Find the R first. In front of that, if you have a downward deflection, that's the Q. And that's what you were saying. And the only word that I changed from what you said was depression, not depression, downward deflection. Give it, give it up. Okay, find the R wave. If the deflection before the R is downwards, it's a Q. If the deflection after the R is downwards, it's an S. You never expect a Q R S. If you have a Q, the Q has to be wider than 0.04 seconds and deeper than two millimeters for us to consider it to be significant. Okay, so you have very particular criteria. So very excellent job. You've been looking at a lot of EKGs. That's really important. Okay, so we want to really have a good framework in our mind. The easiest thing is always find the R wave. Remember, QRS is all, the whole thing is about ventricular activation, right? P wave is atrial, PR segment is atrial rest. ST segment is ventricular rest. T wave is repolarization. Atria, atrial rest, ventricular depolarization, ventricular rest, ventricular repolarization. Atria also repolarized, but it's really small and you don't see it because it's, you're blinded from seeing it because of the width and the weight of the QRS. Good, everybody good. Very nice job because normally people don't describe it that well. That was excellent. You can give her another high five if you like. Yay, okay. All right, so always be aware of that, that we're looking at depolarization and repolarization. After the ventricle depolarizes, the whole ventricle depolarizes, all current in the ventricle should be static. That means there's no difference in the charge of the cells from one cell to another, from one cell group to another. That's why the ST segment should be at that straight line that you defined by the little line before the P wave. If the ST is above that, it means that your ventricles are electrically unstable. And that's why you get ST segment elevation. Does that make sense to everybody? And everybody's okay with what I've said? Feeling good? Feel like you're feeling pretty good about the EKG because this is going to be pretty important to you. It's going to be a important diagnostics. And I'd love to hear after you take your exam that you feel like uh, if there were questions on 12 lead EKG and there will be, you got it. Yay, yeah. All right. So just remember, we start here with our normal EKG, right? P wave, atrial activation, PR segment. We talk about the P wave and the segment as the as the interval. And then we look at ventricular depolarization, ventricular rest, and repolarization. With STEMI, we're always going to expect to see ST segment elevation. That You have to have it. It can't be a STEMI without ST elevation. And it must be in at least two leads of the lead group, right? If we have ST depression, we're going to be concerned. ST depression, we're going to be concerned that that's reciprocal to STEMI. So if I see ST depression in the inferior leads, I'm going to immediately go to the lateral, inferior and lateral. And if I have elevation in lateral, my problem is STEMI with reciprocal. If I have ST depression in the inferior leads and I look to lateral and there's no ST changes there, this is actually most likely a non-STEMI. What's the difference between STEMI and non-STEMI? STEMI, yep, ST elevation, excellent. Full wall thickness or partial wall thickness. Non-STEMI is partial wall. STEMI is full wall. Do they both spill troponin? Yes. If I have ST depression, but no elevation troponin, I'm gonna call that unstable antigen. Good, everybody good? Feeling pretty good about that? Feel like you're gonna be able to remember that, look at a test, be able to differentiate that? Uh, I, I can, if I remember what I said, I'm gonna try. I might say it, I might say it differently. Okay, so I'm looking at the EKG. If I have ST segment elevation, I expect that to be in at least two leads of the lead group. I look at the opposing wall, if I can see it. I look at the opposing wall, the opposite wall. So typically that's only gonna be inferior and lateral. And for our purposes on your test, 
right? On our, on our test, not in a 12 lead EKG program, but on our test, ST elevation in the inferior wall, I'm gonna to expect to see ST depression in the lateral wall. What, sorry, I used my hands incorrectly. ST elevation in the inferior wall, ST depression in the lateral wall. Am I gonna be spilling troponin? Because I have a full wall thickness, which is why I see changes on two sides, because it's a really big change. I look at the EKG and I see ST segment depression in the lateral wall, one and L. I immediately say, oh, is this reciprocal for elevation? I look at two, three and AVF, there's no elevation. I go back and I say, I've got ST depression. And then I look at your troponin. If I'm spilling troponin, I am having what? A non-STEMI. If I have ST segment depression, we're just talking about in this context, I have ST depression, but I'm not spilling troponin, that's gonna be unstable angina. Because unstable angina, you're not lysing muscle. Unstable angina is a warning. Non-STEMI is uh, you didn't obey the warning and things are getting worse. And STEMI is now full wall cell death. Good? Feeling good? All right. Awesome. Awesome, awesome, awesome. Hope everybody on the call is doing okay. And now with non-STEMI, a couple of things happen. With non-STEMI, you can have ST segment depression. Again, not necessarily in multiple leads. And you can also and often do have T-wave inversion. Okay, now T-wave inversion is a little more complicated subject. Just remember, you most particularly want to be able to differentiate on your exam, STEMI. You want to isolate where that STEMI is occurring, and you want to think about the things that you might see with that STEMI, okay? So that's a really important concept. So I'm again going to remind you about your group lead analysis. I'm going to say it multiple times. I'm going to say it every time I talk to you about cardiology and cardiology two, cardiology three. I'm always going to say it. Always remember you look at leads in a lead group, right? Two, three and AVF is inferior. One and L high lateral, V5 and six low lateral. So one L, V5 and six are lateral. V1 and V2, anteroseptal, V3 and V4, pure anterior. Say it again, say it again, say it when you go to bed, say it when you get up. It's now your new mantra. Lead two, three, AVF, inferior. Oh, I sound like a monk. I love that. Okay, and just in case you didn't get it, once again, this visual. Okay, when you look at a 12 lead EKG, trying to discern a STEMI, always look in lead groups. So you give a quick view and then you say two, three AVF, one L, five, six, V1, V2, V3, V4. Always look and think in lead groups so that you can really identify where your changes are occurring so that you can do the right thing for your patient. Okay. All right. I think we already discussed this. It's like, uh, oh my goodness. I thought it was so important. I thought I had to say it twice. Okay. So Let's take a look. Sorry about that. I had three repeat slides there. So let's take a look at this. Okay. Looking at this as a lead group, I want you to remember you look one, two, three, AVR, AVL, AVF, V1, V2, V3, V4, V5, V6. Down at the bottom here, you have two rhythm strips. We do rhythm strips when we're doing a 12 lead EKG so we can look at a longer strip of information to determine rhythm disturbances. So don't look at the two bottom ones right now. Just look in lead groups. Okay, now I've already told you what it is. Okay. Okay, but let's take a look at 2, 3, and AVF. 2, 3, and AVF. Do you have ST segment elevation? Yes or no? No. 1 and L. Do you have ST segment elevation? Lead 1 and AVL. Do you have ST segment elevation? A little tiny bit, good Rose, just a tiny bit, just a tiny bit. It's about one millimeter up, it's tiny. So then I say, well, if I've got tiny ST segment elevation one and L, let me go over and look at V5 and V6. Do I have ST segment elevation V5 and V6? Everybody agree? Okay, good. 
And then I say, oh, I've got it in the anterior lateral lead. So now let me go towards the anterior, V3 and V4. Do I have ST segment elevation V3, V4? Yes. Now I'm going to go to the septum, which is one and two. Do I have ST segment elevation one and two? I'm having a pure, a large anterolateral, what? What? STEMI, non STEMI, unstable. STEMI. Do I know your troponin is going to be elevated? Yes. Okay. If I have any time at all, I'm going to give you heparin plavix and I'm going to get you to a cath lab. The sooner I open your artery, the better it is. I work in a place where there's no cath lab, which basically we don't even really ever talk about that. Fibrinolysis is an option. I'm, I'm out rurally in some 20 bed hospital and it's 300 miles from the nearest center. Why did you move there? Okay. So you're 300 miles from the nearest major center. You're going to get fibrinolytics like TPA or Altaplase or something like that, right? TPA and all its children because you don't have a cath lab. And time to an open artery is the most important thing. I've got to get that artery open as quickly as possible. Cool? Make sense? So if I can't give you heparin or plavix, I'm never going to delay getting you to the cath lab while I'm waiting to get my heparin and plavix. You're going to the cath lab. If your cath lab is ready, you're going now. They'll deal with you there. I don't have to give you medication. But if I have time, I will. And that will be your question. Do you identify this patient? Is this patient worrisome to you? Yes. Is this a STEMI? Yes. Are you infarcting your whole anterior wall? Yes. This is probably a left main because you're infarcting the anterior and the lateral wall. Good. So if that patient is allowed to exist underneath your care while you're hemming and hawing, they're probably going to die. Cool? Not cool. Not cool if they die. Cool because you know to do the right thing. Okay. I'm sorry to say I've given you the name of every infarct here. I don't know why I did that. Okay, quick look, starting with, remember V1, lead one, two, three, AVR, AVL, AVF, V1 through three, V4 through six. Do you see anything that worries you? Yes or no? Yes. And what you see is ST segment elevation. In what lead group? Which is what? Inferior, two, three, ABF, everyone agree? Inferior, okay, excellent. Because it's inferior, I have some expectation that I'm gonna see lateral reciprocals, which means in the lateral wall, I'm gonna expect to see ST segment depression. Do I have depression in the lateral walls? Yes, everybody agree? Depression in one and L, yes? Everyone agrees, everybody has to agree. Even the people who are asleep, you have to agree. Hi, darling. You worked last night, didn't you? Oh, God. Lullaby. Dream of STEMI. Okay. And so I, I'm, I'm not offended in any way. I am honored that you came here today. Please. I'm joking on you. It's really okay, man. It's hard. And the thing is, she came, even though she knows she can watch it on recording, she still came. That's pretty awesome. You guys too? Okay, oh, okay. We, uh, what I'm hearing is, it, what I'm hearing here is appreciation envy. I'm appreciating her. So he said, well, we worked last night too. All right, everybody worked last night. Thank you, thank you so much. I really honored that you came. And you can, of course, watch this again, but you're going to get some of it even through, you're going to dream about STEMIs. I'm sure of it. All right, my friends. So everybody can appreciate ST segment elevation, inferior ST depression lateral. Okay. Inferior means what coronary artery, right or left? Right. Right, right. right coronary artery supplies primarily sinus node and the AV junction. So do you expect that you might have PR prolongation? Yes. Might you also have wanky Bach? Yes. yes. Okay, good. So that's what you're going to think about. Beautiful. Are you going to give this patient nitro? They just came under your care because they're having inferior changes. What do you need to do? You need to have some consultation, right? Because if they're infarcting their right ventricle and or their posterior wall, which they can easily do if they have an RCA, you don't want to give them nitro without volume. They'll get nitro eventually, but they got to get volume first. Okay, cool. Very good. That was awesome. All right, we're doing really good. We're doing really, really good. Oh, 
It's already 10. Are you kidding? Oh my gosh. All right, my friends. I am gonna, uh, well, you know what? Yeah, we are almost finished, but that's okay. You know, we got people who stayed up all night. Just stay for one more moment. And everybody, you know, I appreciate that people are tired and they have to do all sorts of stuff. Okay. All right, my friends. So I think everybody is still on the call here. What do you see? And are you certain or not? Are you certain? Are you certain that you see something? Yes or no? Okay. When you looked at your EKG, remember now on this one, we've got three rhythm strips on the bottom. Do you have ST segment elevation? Yes. In what lead group? Or just tell me the leads. Where do you see ST segment elevation? V1, V3. Okay, so are you having a infarct? Yes. Is it a STEMI? Do you expect troponin to be elevated? Yes. What wall is involved? No, well, the lateral, but oh, no, 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 guys. Look, look. You have ST segment elevation in every single chest lead. V1 through V6. So this is a very large anterior with septal and lateral extension. But all you have to say is it's a large anterior. This means that it's a proximal LAD or more likely it's a left main, which means it's time of the essence. It's always of the essence, but even more so. Okay, so you, you were doing a great job. Yes, it's low lateral. Yes, it's anteroseptal. Yes, it's anterior. Marry it together. It's a full anterior wall infarct. Do you expect your opponent to be elevated? I mean, it's gonna be really elevated because you're lysing a lot of muscle. Is it possible that you're gonna have a right bundle branch block? Yes. yes. Is it possible that you're gonna have a full left bundle branch block? If you have both right and full left bundle branch block, what are you gonna have? Yes. Complete heart block, which will then be sudden cardiac. Okay, so you know what that means? I love that you wanna do CPR, but the patient's under your care. He's got, he's got full cardiac death. You gotta pace him right away, right away, because he can't activate himself. You're gonna have to pace him right away. He's still got some functional myocardium, probably most particularly the right side. Might still have a little functional left side. You gotta pace him right away. All right, we're gonna end here. If you reach out to me, you say, I'm really interested in a 12 lead class. I'll put together a 12 lead class. I'll try to do it before you have your test. But then that means you have to come to the class, right? Here, we just try to do summary stuff and just get the keys. Hopefully you got some keys to your 12 lead EKG. Hopefully you feel like you've evolved your knowledge a little. Very, very, very important on the CCRN exam because they will show you some 12 lead EKGs. You will have to be able to interpret. You need to use your judgment. You need to make good decisions going forward. Two hours from my point of view never went so fast. And I hope everybody enjoyed their time. I'm going to see you next week. And I will send you the electrical uh, connection so you can listen again if you desire. Thank you very much. Yay! Go CCRN! Woohoo! Thank you, everybody on the phone. Appreciate you so much. And uh, we'll see you next week. Yes. Yes. Oh, you guys are awesome. You guys online. Thank you. You did a really nice job. And hopefully- Thank we're you, Miss Barbara. Hey, hang on one second, my friend. Yes. I've got one thank question. Thank you. Oh, thank you, love. I appreciate your coming. Thank you. Okay. okay, hang on one second. Guys, um, you're welcome to stay on. I've got a few folks with questions or you're welcome also to go either way. I will be sending you the link to the virtual recording, okay? But you're welcome to stay on if you have questions, okay? All right. Yeah, and by the way, George, I do PowerPoints all over the world. No, I have to click the PowerPoint. It wasn't the problem of the PowerPoint. It's that I'm showing virtual real-time and recording with a microphone and my computer can't support it. But thank you for the advice. I appreciate it very much. Thank you. Okay.
hour or two. No. You're no, you're you you need to know what the strength is, which one you're using. So if you're are you doing push to you're talking about push to push to step and effort? Push to Okay, you should already have push to step and effort on your pharmacology card because we got an approval for that. And it is diluted. It has to be diluted if you're doing push dose. Yes, it has to be diluted. You cannot use the standard epi when you're doing a push dose epi. Epi, which would, that comes in a 10 milliliter vial, is full of one. One to 10. One to 10. And then push. And then push dose that epi. And your pharmacist should actually be doing it. One to 10. So you pull one, mix it in nine. Now you've got 10 cc's. So if we pull it from the one, I mean the 10 milligram per 10 milliliter, which is one to one. Right. We mix it with nine milliliters of seven. That I'm not sure of. Okay. Okay. So I know that, uh, and I, uh, you know what, I can give you an answer on this in just a minute. Okay. Let me just be sure. Okay, guys, we're having some questions about uh, mixing and doing push dose epinephrine, uh, which probably doesn't really pertain to you. Do you all have any questions that I can answer before you all, uh, before I actually stop sharing? And thank you, you guys, for being so lovely and saying thank you to me. You're so kind. Hopefully everybody has uh, felt like they got some evolution, their understanding of 12 lead EKG. Next week, we're gonna put all this together in a multitude of uh, evaluation. But if you all don't have any questions, I'm gonna say thank you for coming. Thank you, thank you. And I'm gonna end and I'm gonna say bye-bye for now. All right, my friends. Thank you very much. Bye-bye for now. I don't come back to this.